Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, and everyone else. <laughs> Welcome to Bethel this morning. If you're out in the foyer, please feel free to make your way in. Um, we're going to sing, sing some songs this morning, um, both in, in praise to our God and in encouragement to each other. So please stand with us as we do that. This next medley we're going to sing has some older songs that I trust most of you will be familiar with it. And if you're not, just uh, enjoy the words. Will I bless thee? I will lift up my 
Actually, Actually, before you, you sit, sit down, down, why don't you say hi to someone who's beside you, someone you haven't met yet, whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> All right, do I have that on? There we go. All right, good morning, everybody. It is really good to see everybody, to be with you this morning, and just a, a big welcome to all of you that are here, all of you that are watching online, and just uh, a bit of a special welcome if you're someone who's maybe visiting or hasn't been here that many weeks before, uh, maybe haven't been here for a while. We're just so glad that you are able to be here this morning and trust that the Lord will just meet with us and be present here with us, that he'll draw near to us. And, you know, I, I, every Sunday I kind of just have this, this thought or this awareness that, um, that we all come through these doors carrying our own burdens, just these different things that, that have been part of our lives and our week and uh, things at work, things at home, things in relationships, and we just kind of are coming with those, uh, those burdens attached to us. And I, I just really believe that, that the Lord, when, when we're in this place, there's just this way he wants to come and come and, and actually really speak and minister and, and, help us, and help care for those burdens that, that we've come through the doors with this morning. And so I pray that'll be the experience that you have, that you'll leave this place encouraged and uh, feeling like the Lord spoke to you and guided you and and, and gave, you, uh, gave you something that you needed today. I, I don't have too much to share with you this morning. I did want to just make sure that you, uh, that you check your bulletin and take a look at some of the things in there. There's some uh, things in there about some upcoming events for ladies, uh, ladies fellowship night. There's, or I guess it's a morning. There's, um, there's something about our Sunday school picnic coming up in June. In, on the back of the bulletin, and um, there's also a finance update if you're kind of curious just where we're at as far as our financial giving uh, to this point in the, in the budget year at our church. There's a little uh, graph that shows you some of that kind of information too. 
And I did want to just mention, I was wondering if Andrew Fitch might be here, but uh, I think they had a great weekend with the garage sale at River's Edge Camp. I heard it went really, really well. <clears throat> and so I wanted to just make sure we celebrated that. But I also wanted to make sure that all of you who are parents with kids that are maybe thinking of going to summer camp at some point over the next few months, we have something in our budget uh, called the Camper Subsidy, where we want to just help you send your kids to Bible camp. And so there's some forms at the back, and if you decide to send your kids to a, a Bible camp this summer, then we're, we're prepared to pay about half of the, of half of the cost so that you can, uh, you can send them, and half will come from us, half from you. And so you can grab those forms if that's something you do, and we want to make sure you're all aware of that. It's a really special thing to send <clears throat> kids to Bible camp. It seems like God, God speaks to the hearts of children at camp in a really amazing way. Well, that's about all I had for just kind of get, getting some announcements out of the way. But we really are here this morning to worship the Lord and to receive from Him, uh, to fellowship with one another and to hear from His Word and, and all those are good things. I, I just thought I'd ask Kent if he wouldn't mind just starting off our service in a word of prayer here and then we're going to just continue singing together. Why don't you stay with me as we pray. Father, thank you uh, so much for your house that we can be here this morning praising you together and we pray that our uh, praises as we lift them to you would be uh, pleasing to you and uh, would just glorify your name thank you for each person here and pray that uh, you would bless them as we bless you in Jesus name, amen I'm just going to read <coughs> excuse me, from Psalm 107 <coughs> Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let's do that together. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving God. This as the flood where the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who his love will not remember who will cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout heaven eternal days on the mount of crucifixion on the open deep and wide through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in and from above, heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. Let us all his love accepting, love him ever all our days.
Thank you so much to our worship team for just uh, guiding us in those songs of praise and those, those words of truth this morning. Great place for us to just allow our hearts to be turned up towards the Lord and to magnify him and to uh, remember his goodness and his, who he is in our lives. It's, uh, it's good to see Don Williams is here today. Yeah, that's good. Don, uh, Don had a hip surgery on Monday, and uh, he had, that time we thought maybe he'd be in the hospital still on this Sunday. Like, didn't know exactly how long, but they said it could be a week. But I texted him, and he said, uh, I said, How's, how are you feeling, Don? And he said, I, I was home on Wednesday, and I got home in time to watch the Flames game. <laughs> so I think he was doing pretty good. And I'm guessing we have maybe a few nervous Flames fans here, I, Don, Don, be careful tonight, okay? <laughs> be careful. That hip's still healing. No jumping, no uh, leaping around. I, I was doing a little leaping around last night, but uh, you, uh, you be careful. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if my nerves can handle a battle of Alberta. That'll be, that'll be something. Well, before I begin uh, just sharing, I, I want to just give you a picture of what the next few Sundays are going to look like here at, uh, at Bethel Church on, uh, for our worship services. Um, I think many of you know this and are aware that this will be my, my final Sunday here for a few months. Uh, I've been given a sabbatical time from the church. It's just a real um, amazing gift. And uh, during this sabbatical time, we want to just do our best to, to share just the details uh, of each upcoming Sunday service so you can, you can know what to expect and know who you're going to be hearing from uh, each week when, uh, when you come here. So I think we have a little screen here where you can see what's, what's coming. So uh, Pastor Bruce is going to share, uh, uh, finish off our, our, our Ruth sermon series next Sunday. And then we've invited Keith and Stephanie Dillabaugh. Some of you know them. They're Working in, they live in Carstairs and working with an organization called Family Life Canada, and they'll be sharing a little bit on marriage and relationship focus that that Sunday. And then we'll hear from Pastor Chris for a few few Sundays, and Kelly Lyondick will take our Father's Day service. And I can be looking forward to all of these. I, I I do want you to just know that during this time that that I won't be here uh, like I'm like it's like we're used to. I do want to let you know that you can come to this, this church every Sunday morning uh, just expecting and anticipating to hear a very clear message from God's word and, and, and an opportunity for you to respond to him in obedience to whatever it is that he's saying to you. Uh, you'll hear from Pastor Chris and Pastor Bruce. Uh, you'll also hear from many of our Bethel Church missionaries that we support. A lot of them will be here at different points of the summer especially. Uh, we also have a few guest speakers that will come that we're just excited to introduce you to, just really good people who have a good message to share, people like Keith and Stephanie that maybe you haven't gotten to know yet. But I am just uh, fully confident, I, I can say that 100% sincerely, I am fully confident that God will meet you and that God will speak to you each and every weekend. And I'm just so grateful for all of those who are willing to help out in all these different ways while I'm, uh, while I'm not here. You know, we had a really special Sunday last weekend. We had Pastor Lance and Linda Duncalf back here with us, and it was just a wonderful morning. And even though they're not here, I want to just make sure I say a big thank you to Pastor Lance for sharing just a really personal and a really wonderful Mother's Day message with us last week. It was just wonderful to see them again, to see the crowd of people just waiting to hug them and shake their hands and visit with them after the service. 
Well, this is the third week in, uh, in a series that we started a, a little while ago uh, through the Old Testament book of Ruth. And like I said, Pastor Bruce is going to finish off this series next, uh, next weekend. <clears throat> when you think of the book of Ruth, just this tiny little book in the Old Testament, it's written 3,000 years ago. And I, I've been kind of saying, even though it's such an old story and in some ways such a simple story, I've been saying it's actually a story for our times. It has a lot to say for us here in the times that we're living in. And when you think of the book of Ruth, perhaps you think of it as maybe a bit of a love story. Maybe you remember that amazing line, that famous line, wherever you go, I will go, your God will be my God, this amazing statement that Ruth gave to her mother-in-law. Maybe you remember Boaz as this kinsman redeemer, or, uh, or his connection that he had to the, to the lineage of King David that would be unfolded over time. You know, we, we might think of those kind of things when we think of the book of Ruth. But the ancient Hebrews that would have received this, this, uh, this book, who would have talked about it and studied it, the ancient Hebrews would have viewed the book of Ruth in a different way than we do today. Uh, the, the book of Ruth was, was part of uh, something called the Hebrew megaloth. Megaloth. And that word megaloth just means five small scrolls. The five small scrolls. These five small scrolls were the Old Testament books, these short little books that we find in the Old Testament. Books like Ruth and Esther and Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Lamentations, these five small scrolls. And each of these short books had a specific connection to one of the five annual feasts in Israel. Um, during each feast, one of these small scrolls would be read out loud in its entirety, along with a specially chosen text from the Torah, from somewhere in the first five books of our Bibles, from the first five books of the Old Testament. And so the book of Ruth was, was connected. It had this partnership with the annual feast of Shavuot. Shavuot. Yeah, that's later known as the Feast of Pentecost. So during this annual feast, the whole country would, would kind of have a holiday time. And sometime during this feast, Exodus 19 and 20 would be read out loud. That's when God gave the law to Moses. And so someone would read Exodus 19 and 20 out loud, and then the entire book of Ruth would be read out loud as just part of their holiday, part of their celebration. That Exodus reading, Exodus 19 and 20, it is epic. It is magnificent. magnificent. It is just filled with dramatic images Images of mountains on fire and trumpet blasts and thunderbolts and lightning and a God who just shakes the earth. Listen to a passage that would have been read during this feast from Exodus 19. Here's what it says. It says, On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> You know, the contrast between these words and then the book of Ruth is just shocking. They, they seem to have no connection whatsoever. In, in Exodus, we encounter this God who thunders and roars, a God of awesome power, a God who causes people to tremble in fear. At the festival of Shavuot, the people would listen to a passage like this one. And then they would listen to the story of a quiet woman who comes from a foreign country, desperately trying to survive in a famine. And it's the story of a little, small, 
unfamous family, facing tragedy, facing death, filled with grief and sorrow. It's a story of God's loving kindness through the obedience of just very ordinary people. There are no supernatural, epic miracles in the book of Ruth. The voice of God doesn't ever thunder and roar. There are no mountain-shaking moments where people tremble in awe. (laughs) There's nothing like that. Ruth is the story of very normal, regular people. They aren't spiritual giants or holy heroes. They are broken and they are needy. They're empty-handed people. They have nothing. They're just hoping to find God. They're just hoping to find a way to follow his ways through the unfair troubles, through the unfair and the deepest griefs of life. So Ruth is really a story about relationships. We're only halfway through, uh, but we've already looked at the relationships of family, wives, husbands, children, in-laws. We've talked about the seasons of death and grief and sorrow that are part of our relationships. We've talked about the love between the older generation and the younger generation in, in a family. We've talked about neighbors and community and and finding that place where you can belong. We've looked at our relationships even with strangers, with foreigners, with people who come from another country. The relationship between employers and employees. Talked about our relationship with political enemies, with national enemies. And we've learned that our our lives are interconnected and dependent on others. We're, We're made for relationship. We're not made to be separate or independent. We're not self-made, self-sufficient people. We're we're people who rely on one another, need one another. So in all of these human relationships that we discover in the book of Ruth, we just catch these glimpses of God, these glimpses of God and and his amazing glory. He's a God who, who brings people together at just the right time, a God who provides for our daily needs, a God who shows his loving kindness through the compassion and also the kindness of other people, even strangers. The book of Ruth is just ordinary, regular people having these fairly regular and ordinary experiences with God. They're they're things that we can all relate to, having your needs met, having your food provided. Uh, having a good friend, having a a family member who loves you. But all of these things that we see in the book of Ruth, they they are no less magnificent. They are no less magnificent than a God who thunders, or God who covers mountains with fire and smoke. When we ended chapter 2, Ruth and her mother-in-law, a lady named Naomi, they were still in a very desperate place. There were some signs of hope, some signs that things might be turning for them. Both of their husbands had died. These were two widows, one older woman, one younger woman. They had traveled to Bethlehem together. They were living off of just the food that they could scrounge in fields that had already been harvested. And their future was, was still very quite, uh, still quite hopeless. But they had, they had met this man, a man whose name was Boaz, who was being very kind to them. He, he was a stranger to them. He wasn't someone who knew them. But Boaz was, he was a distant relative of Naomi's husband, but uh, didn't never met Ruth. And even though Ruth was a foreign woman who was from an enemy country to Israel, Boaz had taken responsibility to provide food and to pri- provide protection for both of these ladies. So I want to pick up the story in Ruth chapter 3 and Read what will happen here next with this, this story. I'm going to read the first six verses. It says, One day Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you, take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you 
until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. I'll just pause there for, for a moment. I guess the thing to say first is that this, this once again here at this story, we, we just see this amazing commitment and devotion and love that is formed between Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Very special relationship. Um, Naomi was not obligated to provide care for the widow of her son. That, that didn't need to be her responsibility, but, but she took it upon herself to provide some kind of long-term security for Ruth. Ruth, uh, sorry, Naomi was poor and alone herself, but she had been watching, and I think she probably had been praying for an opportunity to, pr- to provide Ruth with some kind of a hope for a future. And when, when Naomi saw the kindness of Boaz, she saw that, that an opportunity, uh, this opportunity they had been waiting for, it, it, it might have arrived. You know, I think at this point in the story, we can, we can just say we've all watched enough movies, we've all read enough novels to start kind of imagining and putting these pieces together of some type of a romantic love story between Ruth and Boaz. We're, we're already kind of hoping for some kind of a Cinderella-type story of this poor, overlooked woman meeting Prince Charming and living happily ever after. That's kind of where we're already starting to go in our minds. Boaz and Ruth, they've both shown us that they both have very high character. They're good people, and so we're cheering for them, and we we want them to get together. There are certainly elements of love and romance that that form in this relationship between Ruth and Boaz, but but here in chapter 3, we're we're not quite there yet. This plan of Naomi's, everything she's saying here, it, it isn't as much about romantic matchmaking as it is just about a desperate need to survive. (laughs) That's her motivation. Ruth's life depends on finding someone who can take care of her. That won't be Naomi. Naomi is going to call now upon the laws of the land and also the kindness of Boaz to try to make this happen for Ruth. There were laws in place at that time that, that would allow a relative of Ruth's dead husband to take ownership of Ruth, to take ownership of her. Now, ownership, that's not a very romantic word, is it? (laughs) But that's really what Naomi had in mind. This relative would bring Ruth into his household. He would provide for her needs. He would take over any land or any possessions of her deceased husband. There was no obligation to do this because it could become quite costly. It could cost a lot to that person. It could require great sacrifice. And if the two of them did happen to marry and have a child together, then this woman and this child would be brought into the family line of of this new husband, the family redeemer, the family redeemer, a family liberator, family liberator. So Naomi was using this combination of, of keeping the law, of just a desperation to survive, and this, just this desire to maybe be in the right place at the right time to see if Boaz might save Ruth's life, might bring her into his family, might take ownership of her. So she instructed Ruth to have a bath, <laughs> to get cleaned up, to dress in her nicest clothes, to put on some perfume, and then place herself in a position where Boaz would be forced to notice her. And so I want to read what's going to happen Next in this story, we're just going to read verses 7 and 8. It says, After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. <laughs> So while Ruth was busy getting dressed and putting on perfume and making herself look good for this big occasion, Boaz was eating some food and drinking some wine until he passed out. That's kind of what was going on. 
Like I said, it's not very romantic yet. (laughs) So Ruth came to him quietly, it said there. This means that she didn't want anyone to see her. Uh, Ruth was actually taking a very big risk in, in going to meet with Boaz like this, late at night, privately. She was this foreign woman who people were already very suspicious of in that community. She wasn't someone who was trusted. The women of Moab, where she's from, they had this reputation for being very loose, promiscuous kind of women. She could have been maybe arrested or caught or or maybe in some kind of danger if some others saw her. Uh, She was taking a very big risk by doing this. I think she was also trying to protect the reputation and the honor of Boaz. She didn't want others to see her sneaking to the place where, where he was sleeping late at night by himself. So she laid down by his feet, and she waited. Again, still not very romantic. (laughs) Have you ever looked at your feet lately? (laughs) Uh, It's not the most attractive part of our bodies. This wasn't a story of them having a little cuddle together or staring into each other's eyes or anything like that. You know, some Bible scholars here at this point, they would teach and say that, uh, that Ruth laying at the feet of Boaz was actually some kind of a euphemism for a, a sexual encounter that they, that they had late at night together. Uh, there are some that believe that, but I, I don't really see it that way. Um, the Bible doesn't usually hold back and kind of use these secretive ways to say that people slept together. Does, it's usually not unclear when we read about that in the Bible. That's something that's usually stated very openly in Scripture. Now, we've seen that Boaz and Ruth are, are two people who have shown a devotion to God, who have this high character and honor, who respect one another. I don't think we should read this as Ruth trying to trap Boaz through some kind of drunken one-night stand or anything like that. This isn't Ruth being overly seductive and flirtatious just to try to trap Boaz. Um, So at midnight, Boaz woke up. And of course, he was startled and surprised to see that there was a woman laying down by his feet. And so let's read the next verse, just verse 9. He says, "Um, who are you? (laughs) That's a good question. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering kind of the blanket that he, was, that he had, spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. So Ruth asked him there to spread the corner of his covering, his blanket or maybe part of his robe, to cover her. And he said, she said, for you are my family redeemer. You're this, you're this person who the law would say should be, be taking ownership of me. We might not really understand in our culture and kind of our way of of navigating these kind of situations. We probably don't understand how significant this statement from Ruth actually is. In essence, here in this moment, late at night with just the two of them, Boaz has just woken up. Ruth is taking an enormous risk. Her life and her future They depend on what Boaz is going to do next. She was actually asking Boaz there to marry her, to bring her into his family. This was a marriage proposal in many ways. She was asking Boaz to provide a place of refuge, a place of belonging under his blanket, under his covering, right beside him, like a wife would receive from her husband. She was asking to be brought into his family, to be brought under and into his care. Huge risk. We're wondering, what is he going to say to her? I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter here now. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before. For you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary for everyone in town knows that you are a virtuous woman. But while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. 
If he is willing to redeem you, very well, let him marry you. But if he's not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. So Ruth laid at Boaz's feet until the morning. But she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. Then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. He measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back. Then he returned to the town. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, when Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, "What happened, my daughter?" Ruth t- told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her, and she added, "He gave me these six scoops of barley and said, "Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed." Then Naomi said to her, "Just be patient, my daughter." Until we hear what happens, the man won't rest until he has settled things today. So Ruth took this big risk. Her life really was going to depend on Boaz's response, and he responded very well to her. Bless you, little one. Don't worry about a thing. I will do what is necessary for you. All of this sounds so good. This is what we wanted to hear. This is Boaz accepting her proposal, agreeing to redeem her, bring bring her into his family. But we see quickly that there's a problem. There's another man, uh, someone who is more closely related to Ruth's former husband. And and this man had had more of a right. He kind of had the first right to Ruth more than Boaz did. At this point in the story, we're all going... No, (laughs) we want Ruth and Boaz to end up together. That's what we want. This isn't good. At the end of chapter 3, when we finish here, we still don't really know where this is going to go. We still don't know exactly what's going to happen unless you've read ahead. But Boaz has said to her that if this other man was unwilling to take her, then he would accept his responsibility. He would be her family redeemer. He would bring Ruth into his family where she could belong. He would marry her. He would care for her. He would provide for her and give her a future. So before Ruth left, Boaz sent her with these six six scoops of barley at a personal cost to himself by giving giving away his own uh, produce and things that he had he, had, he could have sold for money. At a personal cost to himself, Boaz may, met a very great physical need that both Ruth and Naomi had just for food, for bread, for something to eat. Remember that Ruth had just survived through a famine, a famine that took years and years and years. Back then, bread was life. If you had bread, you could live. You could eat. You could survive. This, these scoops of barley, this, this food that was provided to her, it must have seemed like a feast to her. More than enough. Generous, beyond what she could have ever hoped for, beyond what she would have ever asked for, beyond what she could have ever imagined. Boaz was providing what she needed for life. And he was telling her that he was going to make sure that she would never be hungry again. She would never be hungry again. In Ruth chapter 1, when we started out, this story began with tragedy and with despair, with hunger and death, hopeless, alone, these two women, sorrow, bitterness, do you remember all of that? Empty-handed, broken, And now here at the end of chapter 3, we're starting to see despair turning into hope. Ruth and and Naomi are no longer empty-handed. They have food to fill their hands. They have food to fill their bodies. Instead of being alone, there's this hope that that they may be welcomed into a family where they can belong, where they would be accepted. They may be finding new life and a new future, a new hope through the loving kindness of this man named Boaz. By the end of chapter 3, we can more clearly see God's plan of hope and rescue 
for Ruth and for Naomi. And, and we can also see God's plan of hope and rescue for us. For us. In the story of Ruth, God meets every need of these desperate, hungry, empty-handed people, these two women, through the loving kindness and the self-sacrifice of one man, Boaz. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound familiar to, it all, to you at all? We, we can be reading this book of Ruth through a New Testament lens because we are New Testament people. And we're about to find out next week, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Sorry, Bruce, wherever you are, I'm going to ruin the surprise. Boaz and Ruth, they do end up together. And through them, we, we will one day receive their great, 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 I don't know how many greats, but there's a lot of greats. Their great, great grandson. He was also born in Bethlehem. He was given the name Jesus Christ by his father, Joseph, who was a descendant of Boaz. You know, this story of Ruth, it looks forward to God's redemption plan to meet every need of spiritually desperate, hungry, empty-handed people through the loving kindness and through the self-sacrifice of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truer and the better Boaz, given to all of us by God. Just as Ruth falls down before the feet of Boaz with nothing to offer this wealthy landowner, so so too do we fall at the feet of Jesus with nothing to offer the one who owns everything in heaven and earth. Just as Ruth took this risk Trusting in the kindness of Boaz, so too do we put our trust in the one who offers a loving kindness that can never change and will never end. Just as Boaz offered a blessing to Ruth and called her his daughter, so do we receive a blessing from Jesus who allows us the blessing to be called the sons and daughters of the living God. Just as Boaz was willing to to give up his wealth, to take ownership of Ruth, so too has Jesus given up the wealth of heaven in order to rescue and redeem us, to bring us into God's family. Just as Boaz was willing to give Ruth a place within his own home, so too does Jesus prepare a home for us with him for eternity with this promise that he will never leave us, or forsake us. Just as Boaz was prepared to bring Ruth into his family, so too does Jesus bring us into the family of God and say that you are mine. You are mine. You belong to me. Just as Boaz took on the responsibility and the burden of Ruth and Naomi at great cost to himself, so too does Jesus take the burden of our sin to God the Father and pay the cost himself by dying on the cross for our sins. Just as Boaz welcomed and accepted a woman from a nation that that was living far away from God, so too does Jesus welcome and accept everyone who at one time lived far from God in spiritual rebellion, turned away from him, and he welcomes us. I got a few more. Are you doing okay? (laughs) Just as Boaz was willing to spread his blanket, his robe, and cover over an unlikely bride, so too does Jesus clothe us and cover us, an unlikely bride, with his perfect righteousness. Just as Boaz sent Ruth home with more than enough food for her needs, so too does the grace and the love of Jesus meet our needs fill us beyond what we could have ever hoped for or imagined. Just as Boaz offered Ruth and Naomi this hope for a better future, so is Jesus Christ our hope for a better future and a secure eternity in his coming kingdom. I'm not done yet. (laughs) Just as Boaz gave bread and life to Ruth and Naomi, 
so too does Jesus come to us as the bread of life, able to fill that spiritual emptiness inside every one of us so that we will never be hungry again. In almost every way that we can imagine, Boaz is foreshadowing and pointing us towards the arrival of Jesus Christ, our spiritual redeemer, our spiritual liberator. (laughs) And anyone who falls at the feet of Jesus, seeking refuge, seeking salvation, will receive it to the fullest. For, For all who seek this acceptance of God, Jesus himself will echo the words of Boaz. He'll say, as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. If you're looking for a lesson to take home from the book of Ruth, it it isn't this. It isn't you should all try to be a lot more like Boaz. That's not the lesson. We are not like Boaz. Jesus is the truer and better Boaz. The truer and better Boaz for you. (laughs) We are Ruth. (laughs) If you are in a place of despair and loneliness and sorrow and hopelessness, maybe even a place of bitterness. The lesson of Ruth isn't just wait until God sends you a Boaz, your Boaz. Instead, we should hear, do not be afraid, little one. You are not alone. Your better Boaz has come to you. He has died for you. He loves you, and his name is Jesus Christ. So whoever you are, wherever you've come from, Whatever sin, whatever despair, whatever burden you carry, whatever emptiness you are feeling, a truer Boaz has taken on the burden of our sin and our despair and our emptiness. He has paid the price for your salvation with his own blood, and he has promised to always be with you. Jesus has wrapped us up into the coverings of his loving kindness so that we can know, we can know that we are welcomed and accepted by God. We are his loved ones. He has provided us a hope. He's provided us a future. He's given us life. We have found refuge in the grace and the love of Jesus, this truer, this better Boaz. The book of Ruth, it I kind of want to keep coming back to this phrase. It's a great story for our times because it is the story of very ordinary, broken, empty-handed people who are being saved and rescued by the loving kindness of God. That's my story. That's my story. That's also your story. And it's the story that our world needs to hear today. It's a story for our times. Let's pray together as we uh, finish our service. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these, these wonderful stories. Your, your word says that these stories were given so that we would understand who you are and we'd understand how to live in a way that's pleasing to you. And today I think our posture is, is to just recognize our own neediness, to re- remember and, and see our own empty-handedness as we come before you. Lord, just as Ruth laid down at the feet of Boaz, we laid our lives down at your feet, recognizing our need to receive from you that, that without you, we won't have life. We don't have life to the fullest. We don't have this spiritual life, this promise and assurance of eternal life and salvation. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this descendant of Ruth and Boaz who was sent to us to, to be our redeemer, to invite us into the family of God, to to fill up that emptiness, that spiritual emptiness, that, that hunger inside of us, to be in relationship with God, to know God, to be loved by God, to worship God. Lord, thank you for the ways that, that Jesus has provided for us beyond what we could have ever hoped for or imagined. Thank you for the ways that he has welcomed us. Lord, we once were far from God turned away from him, living with hard hearts in rebellion towards him. And yet he's allowed us to be called his children. 
He's invited us into his family. What a gift. And so, Lord, we thank you today. Lord, I want to thank you for just the answers to prayer for Don Williams and his hip surgery this last week. Lord, we give you praise for that. We were, we were asking that things would go well, and they did. And so thank you that he could be here with us today. Lord, we want to remember Julie Gogolinski as she prepares for some chemo treatments here uh, already this next week. Would you oversee all of that? Lord, would you bring healing to her and care for her family during this challenging time? Lord, I want to just pray for my wife, Coralie, as she's just grieving the loss of her aunt, a, a lady that she was just especially close to who passed away this week. Would you just meet her in her sorrow and in her, her mourning right now, too? Lord, thank you for this, these people. Thank you for this church and for the wonderful ways we can worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to share a last little thought here before we before we end, I just, just want to say this will be my, my last Sunday with you for a while. Uh, my family and we're all planning to pop in on a few Sundays and we're excited to be able to do that. But my sabbatical begins uh, later this week on Thursday when I drive home from work. I'll be, I'll be my last day here for a while. I'll be back kind of into my regular things at the beginning of October. So it's, uh, it's a significant break here, but... Um, Looking forward to it. We, we announced this sabbatical back in January and kind of told you this would be happening. And since then, we've provided some, <clears throat> some written material. I recorded an online video that's on our YouTube channel that just kind of explains why this is happening, explains what I'm going to be doing. I, I think I'll be pretty busy, and I'm excited about that. And, and, and also explains how things are going to be cared for here at the church while I'm away. So I'm not planning to say all that again now because... We've given that to you, and you can go find any of that. But I do want you to know that everything here is being left in more than capable hands, and I'm just so grateful for the gift of this sabbatical time. It does feel that way, something that, that's been offered that I am very humbly able to receive. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm also very sad, and I'm feeling some guilt <laughs> about uh, being away from all of you. I, I do feel sadness about that. Today is kind of a, a hard morning, to be honest. You know, Jesus once said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so that's what I'm planning to do. I, I want to just use this time to be with God, to find rest in him, so that I can be renewed, so that I can be refreshed to serve you and this church with a full spirit, with a healthy body, and with a fresh mind. I think you all deserve that. And a lot of you have let, let me know that you support me doing this and that you're going to be praying for me. Uh, even this morning, quite a few people just came and said, hey, we're going to be praying for you, and that has just meant so much to me. I want you to know I'll, I'll be praying for you as well. Um, we're looking forward to some special memories as a family over these next few months. Uh, even Coralie and I, just some things that we will get to do as a couple will be really special. But we will really miss being here week to week. We love being here. Last year, I read a book that was called The Diary of a Pastor's Soul. And in this book, the author said that whenever he went away on longer holidays or breaks or sabbaticals or retreats, on the final Sunday before he left, he would always say, I love you to the congregation. And he said he always felt nervous doing that. He always felt like a junior high kid <laughs> saying I love you to someone. But that is what I want to say to you this morning. I love you. I love you all. <laughs> uh, I, I love this church. I love being with you and... Uh, I love what God is doing among us. <sighs> Having a moment. <laughs> so I, I will miss you, and I, I will be excited to be back with you in a few months. And just speaking for Coralie and for our kids, Riley and Haley, we, we love you, and we will miss you. We're excited to be back with you soon. <clears throat> I think uh, Pastor Bruce and 
Kelly Leyendijk, two of our church elders, would like to just come and just lead our, our prayer time before, we, before we're dismissed here. I, I came prepared. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan this out, so maybe uh, maybe I'll invite Corley to join me here. Let's stand together as we pray for the six streams. Father, we have, as a body of believers, been so blessed by the, by the ministry of Kelly and Coralie and their family, and we just want to take this time to stand together with them and pray that you would pour out your spirit, your blessing, your encouragement, your wisdom, your direction in their lives as they uh, move into this time of sabbatical time of renewal and refreshment and a time of seeking you and your, um, your, your word and your, your work in their lives. And so, Father, as they um, just enter into this time, we do um, pray with them for a great encouragement and, and um, blessing in it. Father, um, we pray for their children and, and just all that this will mean for them. We pray that their hearts too might be encouraged and strengthened in you and in your word. Um, Father, you are a gracious and loving God. We've, we've um, listened to your working in the lives of people through the story of Ruth and, and um, we recognize how um, purposeful and how intentional your spirit works in each of our lives and in many ways that we we don't even recognize at the time and so we know that you have great things in store for Kelly and Coralie and their children and um, and we anticipate your working in the midst of all of that we just um, want to give you our thanks for them and uh, Again, pray that you would guide and direct in this time in their lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, moment's over. <laughs> God bless you all. <laughs>